Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to today's session. Hello, Nancy. Good to see you. Uh, we're going to get started as people come in. I wasn't sure whether we're going to have this session, but I'm glad we are. So I didn't really um, advertise it. I will uh, in a minute. It just shows you how important it is to share this kind of information. Or people forget, you know, it's... Um, it's very human, and I'm glad that um, we're all the same because it makes me feel very comfortable. We do forget. We forget to come to these live sessions. So uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, today's uh, session is called Wanted, Home for Courses. It's a reflection. The Moodle MOOC is about transpersonal development, reflecting and learning as individuals. So everything that happens is okay because it's all about us. So learning is a holistic event. It's not only about the teacher and the student. It's everything about the teacher as a person and everything about the student as a person as well. Um, I'm going to pass on the mic to uh, our speaker, Dr. Nancy Zingronit in a second. Nancy is a very passionate learner and I think that's very unique for someone who also teaches. She loves to share. She uh, talks and cares about others in an amazing way. It's always others who come first and Nancy uh, comes second. She doesn't uh, talk much about herself, but she's done a lot. She's a leader in the online world and uh, specifically in her area of expertise, which is indeed transpersonal development. It's about going beyond and researching people as more than what we see. And we'll hear more about her background from Nancy herself. She blogs on WizIQ, and you'll have a chance to uh, read some of her blog posts if you go into blog.wizIQ.com, and you can see it right here. Uh, she's also on YouTube, so you can get some of her uh, presentations there. She has a PhD in psychology. So Nancy, it gives me great pleasure to uh, give you the mic and the writing tools. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I always want to say good morning at the wrong time, so <laughs> good afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today, and I apologize to Nelly for not getting the PowerPoint down until about 10 minutes ago. Um, this is a, this is going to be a, um, the sound is not very clear. It's too, Nancy, it's too okay. loud. It's because it's too high. I mean, it's, too loud? yeah, you have to lower the uh, bar in the Wiz IQ area. Yeah, let me go and change the settings. Everyone, if you could add where you're from, I see some people have added that already. That's great. Um, Nelly, can you? Yeah, it's Nelly, a lot better. Oh, yes. It's a lot better, I think. Oh, good. I, I, I turned it down. You're a very powerful speaker, so you don't need to have it that high. <laughs> That's code for loud. That's what that is. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking uh, of, of, from my experience. Um, I've been, uh, I have a PhD in psychology from the University of Edinburgh, but I've been working since the 80s, and actually since the 70s, I think, on um, psychological research into human and psychic phenomena. So I didn't train up in transpersonal psychology. I trained up in a different uh, kind of a, uh, not a subspecialty, but an area that's very related, as you'll see as we go along, 
And over the last 30 years, I've been uh, teaching and doing research with my husband, who's um, my primary father. And um, more recently, the last four or five years, I've been involved in online education related to Lambda specifically in my field and learned everything I know about online education from Nellie. So I'm one of Nellie's students from like. my first <laughs> good afternoon. I always want to say good morning at the wrong time, so <laughs> good afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today, and I apologize to Nellie for not getting the PowerPoint down until about 10 minutes ago. Um, this is a this is going to be a um, the sound is not very clear. Let's see. It's too loud. I wanted to talk to you about how this very interesting. Yeah, let me go and change the settings. Difficulty. Having this difficulty um, has to do with the inability to be able to. Um, Nelly, can. Nelly, do you hear me? Is Oh, good. I, I, I turned it down. So, <laughs> that's code for loud. That's what that is. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking uh, uh, from my experience. Um, I've been, uh, I have a PhD in psychology from the University of Edinburgh, but I've been working since the 80s, and actually since the 70s, I think on um, psychological research into seemingly psychic phenomena. So I didn't train up in transpersonal psychology. I trained up in a different uh, a kind of a, um, not a subspecialty, but an area that's very related, as you'll see as we go along. And over the last 30 years, I've been uh, teaching and doing research with my husband, who's uh, my primary colleague. And um, more recently, the last four or five years, I've been involved in online education related to and or specifically in my field and learned everything I know about online education from Nellie. So I'm one of Nellie's students from one of the very first Moodle for Teachers courses way back in 2009. So that's enough about me. So the topic today there are several topics today. We're going to talk about transpersonal experiences and seemingly psychic phenomena. And this is partially because this MOOC has this transpersonal aspect to it. And not too long ago, you saw a, a talk by one of the primary scientists in my side of the field. And we'll get to him in a little bit. And you've been hearing about other kinds of things that are related to transpersonal experiences. So I wanted to talk to you about how this very interesting and expanding area has this difficulty. <laughs> and the difficulty. Um, has to do with with the inability to be able to provide shared educational experiences to students and researchers who would like to get involved in our topic. Don't worry, Alfonso. Um, anytime you come in is marvelous. And hello to everybody who has come in recently. So the second thing we're going to talk about is the usual response of mainstream science to reports of the phenomena that we study on, we study. And, the, and, and how that contrasts with the antiquity and the ubiquitousness of the phenomena. It's just everywhere. People report it. And people have been reporting it as long as there's been writing and recorded history. And I'm going to talk about the attitude of mainstream science towards, towards the, um, the, the researchers. That, that fourth bullet, bullet point should have just said the researchers a brief history of the attempts to study these phenomena scientifically. And then we'll focus more on the meat of what I want to talk about, which comes from my experience, which is the obstacles, the need first to be able to educate researchers in a credible and effective way, and also teachers, and obstacles to formal education in accredited institutions. And now the impact of the potential of online education to fill in some of those gaps for us. 
um, unlike psychology and many other disciplines, we don't have departments all over the globe. We don't have even individuals in in a significant number of university departments um, who work on these topics. So it's a it's a very difficult thing for us to educate each other and educate new researchers and students in the field. And then I have a moral to the story. story. So a couple of weeks ago in this Moodle MOOC, Dean Radin, who's the senior scientist at the Institute for um, Noetic Sciences, talked about research in the field and about his book, Supernormal, which focuses on things like yoga and meditation and his personal journey, as well as presenting the research um, evidence for some a, a specific kind of transpersonal phenomena that we study in scientific parapsychology. Now, a lot of people don't like that term parapsychology and don't think that psychic phenomena should be studied or much less researched upon, and we'll talk about that. Um, but it's 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 something that's related to the, to all of the things all of the things that people are experiencing in meditation and in mindfulness training it's it's something that that uh, with yoga practice it's something that is coming up again in the consciousness of many people in the world researchers educators and members of the general public and there is this small field that has been struggling for well over a century to do a credible job of investigating the phenomena that people report and at and that field attempts to relate those experiences to physics and psychology and what science knows and there's a difficulty in doing that the primary difficulty for me because I'm interested in education is that we don't have shared educational experiences if you're interested in psychology in general and you go to any university on the globe you're likely to have a fairly similar kind of a curriculum you're going to go through a very similar set of courses and when you get your bachelor's degree or you go on to a master's degree you're going to have a, a body of knowledge that virtually everyone in your discipline will share and that's not true for us so transpersonal experiences such as those that have been talked about in several of the presentations for this Moodle MOOC can be mindfulness, meditation, the notion of centering yourself on your in your life in a positive way, either dealing with experiences that you have are, that are deeply spiritual or attempting to achieve deeply spiritual experiences. Transpersonal experiences may be alternate methods of psychological and physical healing. They may be exploring your potential as an empathetic human being, as an interconnected individual, as a global citizen in some sense, and as a very present citizen of your local environment. And transpersonal experiences also are about encountering and integrating, seeking, and and processing other ways of new knowing and other ways of doing and it inside of psychology in the United States transpersonal psychology is kind of a it's kind of a a, a cousin <laughs> of the mainstream of psychology so it's not as um, it doesn't have as many university environments or uh, programs. It's sort of in a similar situation to scientific parapsychology, but a bit better because certainly people are aware of spiritual experiences and people are aware of what meditation can do for concentration and calmness um, and how mindfulness can help you get through your your day and even now in education um, I don't know if this is a true around the world but here in the US a lot of people are beginning to talk about the use of meditation in grade schools and high schools as a way to sort of center the kids at the beginning of the day hello everybody who just came in new Glad to see you here. Thank you for coming. So that last item on the previous slide, encountering and integrating other ways of knowing and doing, that 
that has a particular meaning for all of us in scientific parapsychology, and that's it. That is that transpersonal practices can lead to what seem to be psychic experiences. In the in the literature of of yoga and the literature uh, that comes from many religious traditions in especially the East. Um, the no the notion is that is as you become more adept in these types of experiences, you experience something something else happens. You have something else around you. You might seem to be suddenly having psychic experiences. And the idea in some of these religious traditions is that's just a byproduct of you changing the way that you interact with the world and the way that you perceive the world. Well, these byproducts are, are something that we're very interested in, and and this is this is a short cat list of some of the things that scientific parapsychology studies. Their experiences that people don't as telepathy, the idea that you can get information or images or emotions from another person's mind or transmit to them, the idea that you can gather information from your surroundings just directly, but in a way that does not involve your normal five senses. That's clairvoyance. That people have uh, urges or feelings or worries about the future that in some ways help them avoid negative things that are in their future or in other ways help them to be prepared for something that's going to happen. And those are premonitions. Other people have dreams that have or visions that give quite a lot of detail about an event that's coming in the future, and that's called precognition. In some of the experimental research that uh, Dean Radin presented in his talk a couple weeks ago in this Moodle MOOC, um, he works in an area called presentiment, and these are psychophysiological experiments that show that people do. Um, react to a photograph that's coming up or a stimulus that's in the future a few seconds before. So unconsciously, you have a sense of what that content is going to be, even though consciously you're not aware of it and your body is preparing for it. And Valentina, I agree with you, memories of a previous life through dreams and is very interesting. And this is another area um, that scientific parapsychology is involved in. And you'll see some others. Uh, 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 we've got out-of-body experiences here, visions and apparitions. I'll show you some examples of some of the, the tales that have come down through history that are now embedded in what we're trying to, to research and research doing using a lot of different methods. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second, what some of those are. So mainstream science, on the other hand, they provide a very inadequate, from our, our perspective, my perspective, I agree with you, Balkas, very much, um, mainstream science provides an inadequate response to these experiences. And in general, you'll hear mainstream, mainstream scientists say that these experiences are entirely unreal. So we need to be looking at what problems are causing people to think that they're having these experiences. And some of the suggestions that they make is that, well, there's a psychological deficit in sensory and perceptual processes. So people who believe that they've had a telepathic experience or a precognitive dream or remember something from a previous life are just they've got something wrong with the way that they deal with information around them. The, another reaction is that this is wishful thinking um, and a tendency to mistake fantasy for reality. Well, that's, that's an answer we're not crazy about in, in scientific parapsychology. We think things are much more complicated than that and that, and that people's experiences are important to honor. But that's one of the responses that we tend to get from mainstream science. These also, uh, mainstream scientists will also say that these experiences may be a result of psychopathology. And what happens there is that individuals who have these experiences don't 
feel comfortable talking about them, either to their family members or to their doctors or to their um, minister or priest or imam. They don't they don't want to bring this out because people have this notion. Mainstream science and physicians and so on have this notion that these things are are not right. They're not. They're not. And exactly, a lot of these skills develop more with meditation. Mindfulness and meditational practice seem to very much have to do with this opening up of these other kinds of of in information and information sources. And that's really true too, Pablo, that people are afraid of looking different. They're afraid of being labeled in a way that's going to make it difficult for them to live their lives. So these kinds of attitudes from mainstream, mainstream science have uh, an impact on the way people live their lives. And then when they get into the nitty gritty of how could these experiences be true in a scientific sense, frequently what we hear are people, these these phenomena cannot exist because they are against the laws of physics. And the folks who work in quantum mechanics think that's kind of funny. There are an awful lot of newer findings that, that support the kinds of phenomena that we deal with. But that's one thing they say to us. And then they'll say, well, it just contradicts what science knows about the natural world and the sensory and perceptual capabilities of human beings. So what mainstream science sees as a problem to be dismissed and not examined, scientific parapsychology sees as, as phenomena that are important to how we live our lives and who we are as human beings, and phenomena that we need to um, pay more attention to. But the experiences have been recorded since the beginning of history, and I've got uh, four here that, that are kind of, you hear stories exactly like this still these days. So I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly. One that uh, we always use when we're talking about the history of, field, of the field comes from Herodotus's history, in which he wrote about King Croesus, who reigned between 560 and 546 before the Common Era. Now, Croesus was planning, you know, he knew that the Persians were on the move and that his people might be attacked, and he was thinking about. Um, Starting, you know, starting a uh, starting a battle first, and and trying to maybe vanquish them and and get their territory. So it was a typical kind of war of that era. And one of the things he decided to do was was to be a little bit more careful about where he got his predictions about his future. So he sent messengers out to a variety of seers and prophets and um, to the Oracle of Delphi to ask them to tell the messengers what he was doing at a particular moment. And the Oracle of Delphi came with a description that was more accurate than any of the other sources. So now he said, well, OK, I can, I can rely on what the Oracle of Delphi is going to say. The complication was the Oracle of Delphi made their predictions usually in a, in a very poetic and kind of symbolic way. Um, so the po problem of interpretation, if you go to a psychic today or you have a, what you, seems to you to be a psychic experience, the problem is always how do you interpret that? So the, the or Oracle of Delphi said, well, if, if he crosses the river between his troops and the Persians, a great empire will fall. And he thought, fantastic, this means we're going to cross the river and we're going to vanquish the Persians. And they crossed the river and the Persians destroyed Croesus' empire. So he didn't quite get the interpre interpretation correct. This is another kind of experience that happens. It's, it's very... Um, interesting and very unusual but it but it is definitely reported and this is this these collective experiences of seeing something some big thing together and so these are in the category of of col of collective views of battles that had taken place and there's a lot of them. There's one from the English Civil War called the Battle at Edge Hill. There are some from there are reports from uh, around World War One. And these are when a huge battle takes place. And when the battle is over, some weeks later, the people who live in the area 
begin to hear the sounds of the battle again or see this the battle being reenacted not on the ground necessarily where it took place but perhaps above the ground where it took place and sometimes what they're seeing seems almost real and other times it's very much like an apparition a ghost um, and the battle of marathon has has accrued this kind of of legend surrounding it. It was again a battle that had to do with the Persians and who they were fighting with on the on the peninsula there, the uh, Greek year, Greek nation states. It was reported by Pausanias, who was a historian, and, and they they called him a um, a geog he was a geographer and kind of a travel log writer. If you can imagine what it was like trying to be a a, a person who went to see different places. Um, in the second century, century AD, he collected experiences from people who had seen the spectral battle of the Battle of Marathon. And supposedly, this battle was replaying for many, many um, decades after the battle actually took place. The interesting thing about it was, unlike a lot of more modern, quote unquote, spectral battles, let me write this down, the people at, in Marathon felt that it was their lot in life to protect and honor the memory of the men who died at this battle and they were not at all frightened by this experience they they welcomed it and these kinds of things are still out there so this is this is a very interesting type of phenomena that's still there in still being reported this is very prosaic this is basically a ghost story that comes from um, the last century before the common area era the original source for it was in the letters of Pliny the Younger, who traveled around the Greco-Roman world and wrote the natural history. And it was about a gentleman named Ath Athenodorus, who was a Stoic philosopher who had rented a house in Athens because he needed to write something and he wanted to be away from people so that he could get the writing done. And the problem was that he heard chains and groaning during the night and, and eventually saw this apparition who kept pointing to the same place on the outside of the house just to the side of the door where some bushes were and and Athenodorus being a philosopher was was not frightened and got up and went out and marked that place in the middle of the night that the ghost had had pointed to and like a lot of these tales that you hear both in fiction and both from people who have experienced these kinds of things the when the morning came and Athenodorus got the workmen to come and dig up the bushes, they found bones underneath where the bush had, bush had been growing. And they buried the bones and the house was no longer haunted. So all the way back to this era before the common era, there were stories like this. And there are stories like this in the Bible and in all kinds of legends and old texts um, used by uh, not uh, fiction writers and artists and playwrights as well as appearing in books like natural history that Pliny wrote where it's it's presented as as a real experience and this is an experience of an out-of-body experience a tale about a person who had out-of-body experiences that was in the natural history that Pliny wrote this was published sometime between 70 and 79 in our era, in the common era. And it goes like this, with reference to the soul of man, we find, among other instances, that the soul of Hermitinus of Clazomenae was in the habit of leaving his body and wandering into distant countries, whence it, was, whence it brought back numerous accounts of various things. This could not have which could not have been obtained by anyone but a person who was present. The body, in the meantime, was apparently lifeless. And then he goes on to talk a little bit more about Herm Herm Hermotinus's experiences and notes at the end, at last, however, his enemies burned the body so that the soul upon its return was deprived of its sheath, as it were. Um, so this is, this is an... an we hear a lot about out-of-body experiences now today, um, and this is a very early example of a, a quote-unquote case. 
So these things have been around for a very long time, and the fact that they have been around for a very long time and people are still reporting them in very similar ways is something that says to us in, in the field that I'm in that these are things that we should be paying attention to in a deeper way and not just saying, oh, that's a dream, you're, you're hallucinating, oh, don't worry about that, that's not real. So mainstream science, however, doesn't approve of the enterprise of researching psychic phenomena. One of the things that we hear often is that, well, these phenomena don't exist. I mean, we know they don't exist. We, we just know that. So any research that supposes that they might exist or that they do exist is a waste of research funds. And certainly it's not an area that's as important as, say, cancer research or research into environmental issues or whatever. But it still is, from our perspective, a legitimate area of research. These are experiences people are having, and the response of mainstream science is not making sense to the people who have the experiences. It's also a, an aspect of human potential that, that requires more research, I think. And then scientists who pursue this line of research are usually characterized as suffering from some kind of cognitive deficit or inadequate scientific training and or we get labeled with that same psychopathological kind of name that we're, we're believing in this reality of our experiences or other people's experiences because we aren't able to reason rationally, rationally. we are not critical thinkers, etc. And those are the kinds of um, comments that we dismiss completely because the majority of us that work on the scientific side of the field have the same types of educational experiences and degrees in conventional departments and conventional um, disciplines as they do, but somehow because we're interested in this particular problem, there must be something wrong with us. And you see that in the characterization of very important um, scientists and philosophers and psychologists and so on who get involved in the field. For instance, William James, who was one of the premier American psychologists of the 19th century and um, early 20th century, founded the, the first a research laboratory at Harvard University for psychological research. He was also very much interested in scientific parapsychology parapsychology, which was then known as psychical research. And he was a very active partner, both in the work of a society you'll see a little bit about in London, and exactly the father of psychology, both, and he was also active in the founding of the American Society for Psychical Research. And in general, people have looked at him and said, well, William James was very bright and very productive in this way, but when you come to this psychic phenomenon, stuff well he just lost his mind and his father was interested in this and you know so he just something funny happened there um, today Brian Josephson who is a Nobel laureate in physics and is at the Cavendish laboratories at Cambridge University very very smart man very very um, uh, innovative in physics, it, it gets the same kind of treatment. He's very interested in our field. He's very interested in the physics that underlies some of the phenomena that we all um, believe exist. And and it's well, he's a wonderful physicist, but in this area, he's gone a little off. So, so that's the kind of thing that we live with. And it and it's not just something that makes it difficult to have a social, you know, go to a party with other people who have a different sense of, of um, what these phenomena mean, but it also has an impact on our ability to get funding, our ability to have jobs, normal conventional academic jobs, our ability to teach what we think we should be teaching, the ability of schools to set up programs and run them. It has a huge impact on scientific parapsychology's ability to actually do the work it has set out for itself. And it's, it's, it's been a marginal discipline. Let me put this down. It's been a marginal science for decades, ever since it started. So it's had these disadvantages that being marginalized within the wider scientific community brings. And that's lack of funding, lack of access, and so on. 
1882, an, a number of individuals connected to Cambridge University, all wealthy, all all um, not in need of a actual job, um, got together and decided to found the Sci Society for Psychical Research. It was an interesting society when it started because there was a religion that grew up around these phenomena. It's still out there. There's a couple of versions of it, spiritualism and then Allan Kardecian spiritism, very widespread around the world. But So there were many people from spiritualism who were involved also in the founding of this field. And, and what the scientists and the hu humanities folks and the philosophers on the one side had in common with the folks from spiritualism on the other side was that they were all seriously interested in trying to find out what these experiences meant, how they worked, what was the process of them, how many people had these experiences, you know, just to kind of get to understand the phenomena that on the one hand was was uh, underpinnings for religious belief and on the other hand was underpinnings for a kind of uh, examination of the human experience. So who you're here, seeing here is Henry Sidgwick was a moral philosopher at Cambridge University. He um, and Frederick Myers, who was a classical scholar and a very close friend of William James, did some very important work in psychology. They actually met as part of a small group of young men in Cambridge who were helping to agitate for the opening of, of college education to women. And they met Eleanor Sidgwick at the same time. Her name was Eleanor Balfour. When they met her, she um, never did get a college education herself. She was rather too old by the time it opened up. But she became the treasurer of Newnham College, which was the second college in the uh, in England to open to women students. And Henry Sidgwick got known as one of the few professors on the Cambridge campus who would actually accept women in his uh, undergraduate classes. Edmund Gurney had also gone to Cambridge University and was a very um, a, a very industrious kind of guy. And these four were the key people among a number of people who founded the Society for Psychical Research. So we count our origin as a science to 1882 when they founded the society, and then the origin of the experimental side of the field to J. B. Ryan. And J.B. Ryan is probably a very uh, well-known name, especially for people from the United States. He was a young botanist with his wife, Louisa E. Ryan. They got, a bot they got their PhDs in botany at the University of Chicago. And they went to work as professors at a university in the mid-Atlantic uh, states of the United States and were basically pretty bored <laughs> with botany. They also were had attended in Chicago a, a lecture by the author Arthur Conan Doyle, who is very famous for having written Sherlock Holmes. And Conan Doyle was a dedicated spiritualist and talked about the possibilities of research and about the experience and phenomena that he'd had. And um, they found that very interesting, and they were they they. They really wanted to do that instead of botany. And through a variety of experiences, going to Harvard to study with William McDougall, and then William McDougall, he was a big psychologist at the time, went to Duke University that had just started. Um, they followed him down there and thought that they would be there six or eight months studying with him and then weren't quite sure what was going to happen next. And instead, they lived there their whole lives and they founded, um, JB became a member of the first the philosophy department of, of Duke University when psychology departments didn't exist on their own. And then he became a member of the psychology department and he founded the Duke, the parapsychology laboratory at Duke University, which existed from um, the 1930s through 1960, the mid 1960s, and from there it became the foundation for research on the nature of man, and now it is called the Ryan Research Center, which you'll see a little bit more about as we go along. So it still exists. It's no longer part of Duke University. His wife came back to the to the laboratory after her, their children had gone off to school. And she was given, he was developing experimental work with uh, telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition. And she, when she came back to the laboratory in 1955, 
1945, she began to deal with all of the letters that were coming into the laboratory talking about these kinds of psychic experiences, telepathy and precognition and so on. So they did an enormous body of work, and for a very long time, from the 70s on, the, the laboratory ran something that it became very important for this being a solution for this lack of shared education, which was the summer study program. We'll talk about that a little bit in a little while. So the definitions of parapsychology are this. I'm just going to read the first one, which is the scientific study of experiences which, if they are, as they seem to be, in principle, are outside the realm of human capabilities as presently conceived of by conventional scientists. So we're studying anomalies, essentially. We're study, And now the field for a number of people are is called anomalistic psychology, but that only encodes a portion of the field because if you saw Dean's talk, you know there's a lot of physics involved as well. But that's one of the definitions. So it's, it's this notion that we're seriously interested in the experiences people have, and now we want to figure out how they work, who they happen to, and what they tell us about what it means to be human. So this is a basic, um, the big old slide that tells you all the different things that we're interested in. And we've been talking about these telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, um, retrocognition, which is very, is very interesting, psychokinesis, which is essentially mind over matter, and survival-related phenomena. When you're asking the question, does some aspect of the human being survive bodily death, that's survival research. And out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, ghosts and hauntings, um, reincarnation, which is the memory of previous lives, all kinds of things are related to this notion of survival research. Inside of parapsychology, there are also hierarchies. Inside of scientific parapsychology, there's also hierarchies. And the experimental side of the field, especially the physics or psychophysiological types of experiments, are considered to be at the p pinnacle. Those of us who deal with um, individual spontaneous cases through case collections and survey research are a little bit, you know, below there. Um, and then folks who go out on into the field to investigate poltergeists and, and mediums and all that, that's a little bit less um, in the group as well. But there's still this willingness to encounter and examine these kinds of, of phenomena. And the methods of study are very similar to other sciences. There's either correlational or experimental laboratory studies we look at um, that look a lot like either psychophysiological research or learning research or brain research and especially social psychological research. That's, that's kind of the same structure of our experiments. Um, and then we have the studies of spontaneous cases, case collections, surveys, and field studies. And then people also do bibliographic research, searching through documents, looking for other examples of these cases and experiences and philosophical ideas about how they might happen. And then meta-analysis is a statistical technique where you bring together a bunch of experimental studies and try to determine if that whole group of studies done by many laboratories, many exper exper experimenters, excuse me, um, really provide some solid evidence. And as you saw in Dean Radin's talk, um, the meta-analyses, as far as we're concerned, do provide what we believe is proof that these experiences exist and need to be understood. Some of the recent experiments have have been uh, dream telepathy experiments that make use of uh, dream laboratories or of some of the modern sort of smartphone phenomena that allow you to wake a person at night while they're dreaming and have them send in a description of their dream and so on. Gonsfeld ESP experiments, and the Gonsfeld is a German word for whole field. It's, as you can tell with the ping pong balls, it's a system of engendering a um, system of engendering an altered state in a person and then having them try to guess the content of a target or a movie clip that someone else is seeing at some distance from the person who is the receiver. Um, distant mental influences, these are what's called as uh, what are 
this is the the name for healing analog so this notion that there is psychic healing exists in many cultures and distance mental influence in living systems uh, is a way of looking at that so you come up with an experiment in which someone tries to to influence calm the arousal of another person or tries to make a change in uh, the healing rate of, a, of an animal or something like that and then remote view viewing remote viewing is probably one of the most famous now um, especially in the wake of the of the uh, making public of the Stargate program um, here in the United States in 1995 when the declassification of the US military's effort to see if they could use psychic phenomena as a way to do safe spying where people could sit in the laboratory and come up with information about a target location elsewhere. So these are some of the research things that are done these days. And now this is a long list of some of the places where research takes place um, in the modern era. And the thing that I want you to notice is that there are only a couple of independent research organizations on this list. One is where Dean Radin comes from and one is the Rhine Research Center. And then there's an awful lot of universities from outside of the US, uh, which is a good thing. Um, University of Northampton's in England, Lund is in Sweden, Freiburg in Germany, the Institute in Germany, uh, then University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, we used to four in Brazil, Edinburgh in Scotland, and then another couple of, of English um, universities. But if you think about this, so this is certainly a, a, a wonderful list, but if you think about it, it's very um, small compared to the number of universities that exist on the planet. Now, there are some places where education takes place and you'll see what if you look at this you'll see that an awful lot of them are BA, MS, PhDs in, in psychology or possibly in another area and the idea is that you're not taking a degree in parapsychology you're taking a degree in psychology but you're doing research on a parapsychological topic and if you look at that again you will see that from my perspective, because I live in the United States, this is this is a not so happy list. It's it's wonderful that there are places where people can go and get education on anomalistic psychology or on scientific parapsychology. But in the United States, there really aren't as many opportunities as there were when I was young, for instance. And this and you'll see at the end we have an, a lot of adult education going on in the United States and myself and a couple of other people are, are, are pushing that. So it, it's not a widespread phenomenon, it's not the way that it used to be and this makes the world, it makes it difficult to, to train up new researchers or to get information about the scientific side of the field into the minds of people that are going to go out and be scientists in other fields or educators or in business or in arts or humanity or in journalism, etc. They don't have a lot of, of ways to become aware of what is actually happening in the field. So, and then there are also possibilities where you can find an individual sen a professor who will work with you if you want to do research or do a term paper or otherwise do some academic work. Um, but again, when you look at, at where these folks are coming from, they're not here. They're not in the United States. So for me, that's a problem in in our country is that we haven't been able to reproduce this kind of education that was available some years back when you know 30 years ago when I first started out and this is a comparison chart that I put together some years ago I was involved with a small online graduate school here in the United States and one of the ways reasons I was hired by that school to be um, one of the administrators was to put together a master's degree in parapsychology and get it accredited and then that school would be the central place in the US where you could get an accredited kind of mid-range degree and the reason why we weren't going for a PhD is partly the school. The school was not accredited for doing PhDs, doctoral degrees, but also it makes sense to me that an individual who's interested in the field should also be getting 
good training in another discipline, a related discipline. So I always thought that this kind of master's degree idea is a really great idea where you've got your undergraduate degree in a conventional area, you're taking a master's degree that focuses on scientific parapsychology, and then you're finding, if you go on to be a scientist, the discipline that you are most interested in to train in so that you can do your research. Um, and when I started out in the 80s, certainly there were a lot more opportunities. So when you look at this, when you look at this uh, table, and this includes both uh, the U.S. and other places in the world, the good news is that now there are more graduate offerings, including degrees, on a global scale. So that has increased. The bad news is that the situation in the United States itself has gone from four universities with programs to two with single courses plus an option to do a PhD. And there has been a sharp decline in single courses at the, at the undergraduate level. So people are not coming into contact with scientific parapsychology in a positive way, if they come into contact with it at all. Now, this was the university. Um, this is the draft of our, our cover sheet for the one of the first uh, versions of this of this program that we put together. And the school that I was at taught an in, a single course in Introduction to Scientific Parapsychology. So we thought, well, this is going to be OK. We're going to be able to put together a credible, academically solid, you know, uh, program that has both pluses and minuses, you know, that doesn't just, uh, you know, provides uh, provides opportunities for people to be able to look at phenomena from a critical and from, from a positive point of view, that it's going to be a good, solid academic program. And we put this together, myself and my husband and several of the faculty members and some of our prospective faculty members, um, with an eye towards providing graduate certificates as well, so you wouldn't have to do the whole master's, but say a six to eight course program in which as a clinical psychologist you could learn about the findings in the field and the experiments and how people do things, um, and then use that in, in your teaching or your clinical practice and, or whatever. So we wanted to have these short graduate certificates geared towards clinicians, geared towards educators, geared towards scientists, and so on. Well, the process was you submitted a proposal, and it went to the accrediting commission, and they looked at the pros and cons, and then they said yes or no, and you were able to move ahead. When our accrediting agency discovered that we were planning on submitting um, this program. And it took them a while to discover that, even though I kept telling them about it. It took, a, took them a while for it to sink in. They were appalled. They were very worried and very upset. And they said, well, what you've got to do is produce a petition to, to make a proposal. So we had a new step now. <laughs> Instead of just proposing that we do this this uh, um, program, now we were going to have to petition them for the right to submit a proposal for the program. So we sat down and we worked the whole thing out. We did. It was about 340 pages. It had an enormous amount of information. I think I might have a slide on what was included. Yep. It had overview of, of the need, you know, that one of the needs was to kind of counteract the popular culture notion of, of parapsychological research in the United States, which is so focused on ghost hunting reality shows that are very not, very not real in terms of what happens on these shows. Um, and also the need in our society to understand these, these experiences. We put in uh, an overview of the program structure. We had we had about 35 courses we were proposing over four different tracks. We we did course descriptions and objectives for everything. We had our potential faculty and our current faculty and all of their CVs, and then we had letters and program um, uh, a letter and program information from John F. Kennedy University in California, which actually was approved back in the 70s to do a master's of science degree in parapsychology and was still able to do that if they wanted to, but actually closed that program in the early 80s um, or late 80s because people were going into mysticism and consciousness instead. 
And then we had 30 letters from professors and researchers all over the world and from Brian Josephson, the Nobel laureate I meant to, mentioned earlier, talking about how important it was to put a program like this together. And we submitted it to the accrediting commission and their response was absolutely not. We literally got a two sentence letter back saying we cannot be associated with such a controversial program. Now in their defense what they were afraid of is that many years before or some years before a group of people had put together a program on astrology. And this is not an area I know very much about but but from people that I talked to, it was a very good program for that topic. Um, and they had accredited it. The Council for Higher Education Accreditation here in the United States um, removed the ability to provide accreditation from that agency, basically deauthorized that agency. And the agency went bankrupt, and, the, and many of their schools were set adrift looking for another accreditor. And the, the, of course, the, the college that had proposed that program also went bankrupt. So they, they had a good reason to be very frightened about the idea of being involved with our phenomena. They're very good people at that place, and I certainly don't blame them, but it was a very disappointing result. Now, there are other problems. Oh, truly, Pablo, that's absolutely true. And this was not one of these sun sign things, but it was, um, thank you for coming, Guadalupe. Um, it was not one of these sun sign astrology kind of things, but it was a very kind of deep program, I'm told. I, I don't know how that works, but anyway, it was, it was had some quality to it. Uh, another uh, uh, thing that gives us the the indication that there's problems with getting this type of phenomena into a college program and getting a college program put together even at a lower level um, is that in in recent years in the UK an online master's program in parapsychology was approved and was offered by a university there and um, it was closed almost immediately within a year for insufficient numbers of enrollment. Later on, um, the, the people who had put this program together said that there were actually, while the government said, yes, you can do this, there were people in the administration at that university who did not think this was a good idea. An enormous amount of delay and misinformation was being given out to uh, the students who were interested in going there. So th there is residual unhappiness at the notion that people want to study these kinds of phenomena in a serious way. And in the US, our, our, we have a lot of university-based online education on the face of it, but the problem is the majority of universities and colleges in the country, and there are not that many, there's a handful, that offer MAs and PhDs in parapsychology are totally unaccredited. And in some cases, they're diploma mills, which means they have, you know, they've started their university, set up a, an unauthorized accrediting agency, had that agency authorize them, and then they're registered with their state or state as a, as a business. And that makes it difficult for people who want to get serious education to find out where they can go. I'm sorry I'm going, getting close to five, Nellie. I'm going to try and speed up here, almost to the end. So the solution in the United States now is to refer people to accredited face-to-face -face schools and online schools where they have a single person or a single course or a professor with an interest that they can study with. And then unfortunately what we have here that's credible is, is online education. Um, it's possible, Pablo, I don't know their situation. Um, so the Rhine Education Center, which is connected to the, which is an online program that's connected to the Rhine Research Center that Carlos and I, my husband and I teach in, is one option. Um, and then I'm listing, of course, my stuff, which is my introduction to the scientific study of psychic phenomena, which is a course that's offered on WizIQ, and I have a Moodle to support it. And then we have an installation in the virtual world, Second Life. Well, I'm very interested in the kinds of things that I'm doing, and my husband and I and, and John Cruz at the Rhine Research Center, who's the executive director over there, we're very serious about providing education of a high quality that anybody can can get into and learn about the field in a serious way but it's very sad that 
you know that that there's not mu there's not anything more official in the United States for people to be able to do because for folks for those of us who are here in the United States or are not part of common of the Commonwealth of of uh, Great Britain um, or are not members of the European Union, it's very difficult for us to get over to to England or to the schools in Europe that have some parapsychology going on and and do a degree without having it cost an enormous amount of money. So it's sort of sad that this is all we've got over here in the U.S., but it's something that we're, you know, the three of us and, and other folk are pouring our hearts into and hoping to um, expand the opportunities. And then the other thing is to refer people to resources online that are credible and serious. I have given in this slide the websites of the Parapsychology Foundation. The main website branches out to four more. Um, particularly important for students is, this, is the PF Lyceum website, which is um, www.pflyceum.org. It's a little bit out of date, but it's got a lot of really good information right up to the middle of the 2000s, of 2005, uh, somewhere around there. Um, the Rhine Research Center website is a very good source. The website of the Society for Psychical Research in the UK, and you can see their advertisement there. And then um, a, a project I have just become involved in, which is called Primer Educational Resources for Scientific Parapsychology that I've put up on YouTube. So I'm going to focus on the things I'm involved in here as I wrap up. The Rhine Education Center, and that's the URL, and it, it, it's uh, live now. It will be live. It's, Nelly has uploaded the uh, PowerPoint to the course, and um, the link is live in the PowerPoint. We offered uh, last spring an Introduction to Parapsychology course. Right now, my husband and I are teaching one course on out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences. And the second course is on premonitions and precognition. Um, these courses are not enrollable at the moment. They're, they're ending in early November. But in January, we will be offering another introductory course and um, a course on research methodology in the field, we hope. So this is a program that's kind of expanding and ongoing, and thanks to Nelly, has a wonderful new Moodle to work on as well. Very easy to use, um, the installation, and a very serious I, uh, commitment to moving this kind of education forward. Eventually, what we're hoping to do is to resurrect the summer study program, which I attended and my husband spoke at, and, and many people attended from 1974 until 2000. Um, I think it was 2002 was the last one. It carried on all those years. It used to be a two-month program in the summer, and now we're thinking about doing a shorter program, like a two-week program that's blended, where we have our materials online, we have some students on site, and then we have other students who can come into the, the live classes um, online and become part of the community of people who are going through that program, even though they're doing it online. So that's something we're hoping to do. But a lot of the institutions in the United States, the Institute for Noetic Sciences also has its own kind of um, its own kind of uh, uh, program. There, folks just don't have a whole lot of money to keep these things going. So that's one negative ne negative negative point. I'm sorry. That's one of our problems that everybody's underfunded, but we're trying to do the best we can. And this this is my own um, kind of, uh, um, I'm always looking for the pointer, and I always forget about the pointer. This is, these are my own uh, uh, efforts that I'm doing. Um, this is the course that's on WizIQ, it's, and this is the link, and it's live on the slide. And you can also find it by searching in WizIQ for the course. Um, it's a hop on, hop off course, and what I mean by that is that it start started originally in April, and it will continue on till the end of March in 2014. We're doing four live lectures every quarter, so we did four live lectures in April, four in July, and we've just done two of the October group. We have two more to come, and in January we will do the last four. And a student can come in at any time and uh, go back and take a look at what's what was there before. Before. They can also become involved in the Moodle where we have some extra materials and some discussions. It's $5 essentially. Next year we're going to start up another one in April. It'll be a bit more expensive, but not too much. We, we're in a situation that because we've chosen this field, we don't have uh, normal jobs. We put a lot of different things together, so we can't offer it for free. But 
once we start the new one next year in 2014, the lectures of this one for 2013 will be uh, re-recorded and popped up on YouTube. So this is one thing that we're doing to try and get that information out to anybody that wants to come in and learn it and understand it. And whenever you join, you have access to all the old materials and all the old uh, presentations, as well as we'll be invited to all the new stuff. And there's a course, course feed for discussion and so on. I'm almost done. Um, the other thing that we've got going is in the virtual world Second Life, which was something I did as I was trying to train in online education um, and got very excited about it while I was taking my first Moodle for Teachers course from uh, Nelly. Um, yeah, here's the here's here's the slurl, the S L U R L. Um, the the Azire Learning Center in Second Life. It's at the moment it doesn't have as much stuff as it usually has in it because I used to have four different sites. One was a library, one was a bookstore, one was the learning center, and then there was a kind of a discussion room as well. And I've combined them all into one building and built the build built the building up a little bit higher um, so that we can do courses in there as well. And I have a colleague who does. Um, um, uh, mindfulness and meditation kind of presentations who also uses one of the floors. So over the next couple of months that center will be full of all of the things it used to have which are free books that you can click on the you can walk your little avatar into the building and click on a book cover and then go out and see um, go out and see the uh, um, the actual book in full text available to read online. I have also information, um, ways to get to articles that are freely available online that you can click on the title of the article and have it come up. We have pictures of researchers on the walls. You can click on that and see their website. And there'll be PowerPoints and some other things there um, as, I, as I populate it again and put it back together. It sits right next door to the building that we have for Nelly for integrating technology for lifelong learners that hopefully will be part of the home for the Second Life MOOC that we do later on. So this is another thing that we're doing. And the thing that I just started recently was I have a YouTube channel um, on YouTube, which I originally got just to be able to keep track of all the wonderful educational videos that are out there on YouTube. Um, and then I began to make videos. Uh, Nelly, in, as some of you know, in Moodle training will, and just in general online training, will talk to you about the importance of giving back to the online community and certainly sharing your knowledge um, via freely av available videos on YouTube is one way to do that. And so I've been doing that, you know, kind of gearing up, ramping up over the years. And now I've started this small series called Primer, Educational Resources for Scientific Parapsychology. And there's only seven episodes at the moment. But what I'm trying to do is, is, is point people towards places where they can get good education in the field, even if what that means is they're going to people who are talking about parapsychology on YouTube or talking about their libraries or teaching courses or having radio shows or the websites of the different institutions and so on. So it's one way that, that I'm trying to um, contribute to free education on the scientific side of the field and kind of make up for the fact that there isn't any official or formal education here in the US and in a lot of other countries as well. That few, you know, those slides showed you a few places, but that certainly doesn't cover every corner of the world. So that's one thing that 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 I've started to do, and ultimately, we're also going to be putting up little snippets of of some of the presentations that we do on the field, like focusing on an individual or focusing on a laboratory or something. That's the plan. So the moral of the story is no matter what your situation is, no matter where you are, no matter how much money you've got or don't have, you just do what you can with the topic that you're passionate about. And if it's elementary education or English language learning or the history of your country or the culture of your country, whatever your educational passion is, you just do what you can to learn more and to give more to the community that's around you. And in my situation, 
I think, exactly. A blackboard and a chalk are the start. Actually, the very first class in parapsychology I ever taught was in my living room. I had three students who were friends of my Thank mother's you. who Thank felt so sorry much. for I'm, me, I'm, I'm sure. Just, and I had a I little mean, I blackboard so that sat stop. on the kitchen table, like propped up against um, one of the cabinets and a, you know, my chalk. And they sat forever. around the really kitchen table with me. And we drank you. coffee and I, I did my little lectures and um, it was good experience. But you do what you can with what you have. So, and then I just wanted to say that I thank, in this journey, I thank very much Nellie Deutsch, who's been my mentor in learning online education, and my Moodle teacher, and my WizIQ teacher, and my video example, and all that kind of stuff. And WizIQ, because WizIQ um, provides teachers with such a huge number of tools at such a great um, affordability level that it's 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 just really a wonderful thing to use and it, and it allows you to do co all kinds of things that way more expensive webinar systems either don't provide or don't provide as well. I'm also very grateful for Moodle and for the whole open educational resources movement because for people like us that are trying to do what we can with what we have, if what we don't have, what we have is not very much, Things that are open source make it possible for us to do what we need to do. And then for YouTube as well, which is a great trainer and a great uh, platform for getting your information across. And then, of course, the WizIQ Moodle MOOCs and Moodle for Teacher courses from integrating technology for uh, all. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for paying attention. And um, I hope you are inspired <laughs> by my journey and go out and do your best with the area in which, you're, um, in which you're working, where your passion is. And I hope you've gotten an idea of, you know, as wonderful as Dean is and how great the research is that he's doing, some of us have a little bit of difficulty in generating new deans, you know, getting young people to get into the field. So, but that's a perennial problem for all of us as educators. So thank you very much. That's me done, Nelly. <laughs> <laughs> the feeling is mutual. <laughs> ah, my goodness. She was a married woman whose colleague was her husband who had a normal life and so then I thought, wow, this is what I want. So I the children part never happened, but for thirty years my husband and I had a place together with colleagues and I've been in the field since I also was lucky in the 1970s when I went to college. At my college, there was a professor, John D. Oh, it chose me. Um, uh, when I was a kid, I I didn't have a lot of experiences. I had some, you know, here and there. My mother and I thought we'd had a dream that was the same um, of an event that didn't happen. So it wasn't precognitive, but we thought it was interesting. We shared a dream. And I come from an Irish and Italian and Hungarian and um, Bavarian and Austrian background. So the, all these different cultures had a lot of, of different, um, yeah, Hungarian only because my great-grandfather's town was, was conquered by the Hungarians for about two months. Um, but they still, you know, <laughs> they still had to say that. Um, and so we heard lots of stories from different kinds of, of, of different kinds of cultures as we were growing up. But mainly it was when I was in high school, I had a very good friend who had apparitional experiences. And they bothered her quite a lot. And I was the kid in the group. There were four of us girls. I was the kid in the group that had the better grades and liked to read. So I, I took it upon myself to go to the local library and read about parapsychology so that I could talk to her about her experiences. And, and I was lucky because I grew up in a very tiny town, um, not super tiny, but I mean 3,000 people when I was growing up. It's quite a bit bigger now. And the librarian there, for some reason, um, was very interested in parapsychology and literally had everything Dr. Ryan ever wrote and many of the British authors and just the best sort of solid stuff in the field. 
and I read a lot of that stuff and I I fell in love with the topic because wow. it resonated to me wow. and to what my friend was thank going you. through thank and so also much. because um, I yes. read Louisa thank Rhine's so books and Louisa Rhine um, and also Eleanor Sidgwick she was a married well, woman who whose time. colleague was her husband who had a normal thank life you. with thank children so and I much. thought wow this and, is what uh, I want so I questions. the children part never happened but for 30 uh, years my husband and um, I have been working together as colleagues and I've been in this field since the 70s course, I also was lucky in that in the in, um, 1970s the when I went to college so, um, at my college the there was a professor John Bisaha who um, his name was John Bisaha not that he's famous but I'm making and, him um, famous. Um, he was a psychologist, and he was very interested in parapsychology and taught Everybody a couple of courses, over there now. an intro course and a I research seminar know. course, and then we were Thank allowed you. to do independent studies. And I uh, studied with him and Brenda Dunn.